afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah List, and I work upstairs in the Information Services Department. And I am pleased, today we are pleased to hear from local artist Lisa Freeman. If you have not already done so, please go upstairs and visit the Quiet Gallery, where her work is on display until January 2nd. Freeman's art has shifted from painting to a focus on assemblage art using found objects drawn to a discarded objects and photographs. She is a collector and Freeman's art brings to light the mystery of the forgotten by collecting objects, both the familiar and the unusual. Freeman is asking us to look, to truly look more deeply Freeman was born in Canada, grew up in the Midwest, and landed in Georgia as a teenager, armed with the powerful resource of observation. Freeman watched and witnessed the human spectacle, taking visual notes and collecting along the way. Lisa Freeman works from her home studio in Athens, Georgia. Please welcome Lisa Freeman. Hello, Hello. thank you. I'm going to ask if everyone's okay if I take my mask down so I can talk. Okay, I think it would be, hello, I'm Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, and thank you for coming. Thank you very, very much. This was a show that was kind of put on hold because Van and I had it set to go and then the pandemic happened. I was set to go in 2020 and it was all set for um, Band Book Month, which was September. So a lot of the pieces that I had had to do with band books. So that was kind of how it got started. And I, I called it something else. And then I came up with, I'm like, okay, well now I need a title for this new thing because some of the things that I had that I had planned, I sold or they were used for something else. So I realized that I have a craft ton of just pieces made from book covers. Um, Eddie Whitlock, who works here, he gifted me a whole bunch of like the, the old, the vintage. So it kind of was a catalyst for using. Okay. See, what I did was I went off my notes, and now I gotta go back. Okay. okay. Um, I am pleased to have the opportunity to exhibit here in athens Clark County Library. I was talking earlier about the importance of the library to me. Um, one of the reasons why, or it wasn't the reason why I purchased and bought a home near here was the vicinity of the library. I never had lived where I could just five minutes get to the library. Like I had to plan a day trip around getting my reading material. So that was one of the reasons why I moved out here. I like, I got my books. Um, they have always meant many things to me throughout my life. They were a refuge when I was a kid. That's where I went. I was a kid that was bullied in school. I can't imagine, but I was. And I would go to the library, and I'd hide in the back, and that's where I found Willy Wonka, and I found the Great Brain series, and Mouse and the Motorcycle, and all of these things that I could just escape to. You know, that's what I did. Um, it's difficult to say which has saved me more times, art or books, or books or art. They're both about equal in that they kind of are interchangeable, which was what was cool about doing the show with the book covers. You know, um, I said that. Okay, now we're going to the next one. Oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. Here on out, we got it. Okay. Up here is called The Search, and these are all pieces that are upstairs in the quiet gallery. Um, this is made from a book cover. It was called The Time of Man. It's just kind of gave you a springboard to make this piece. Um, books are carriers of information and of stories. Humans are storytellers. It's what we've always done to try and make sense of our world, to gain an understanding and our place in it. This piece, The Search, uses as a focal point a photo of a man and a young boy. And I love this one because I couldn't figure out the background of them. I couldn't figure out whether he was a grandpa, a dad, you know, their, their background, their, where they were from or anything, but I just, usually when you find old vintage photos, they don't show background, like you'll see a lot of studio photos. 
And I like the ones that I can find where it shows where people are in their home. And this is what this one did. And they were reading the book. And I was like, well, there we go. Oh, can, can the lights be turned down a little yeah. bit on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, how do we do that? Hey, tech guy. Because you can't really see it, yeah. 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 And I had a little detail of, I, I'll cut out my little people. And sometimes I'll lose some of the little people I cut out. And I'll find them in my house later. They're like stuck to my shoe or something. But these were photos. And I will just, it takes sometimes an, up to an hour or two to cut the photos from the vintage book. But I get really acquainted with the face. It's just kind of like, it's very meditative what I do. But that's one of the, the children that's in it. And they were taken from, it was a school photo. And I just, I found a place to put them. But this one, I kind of, I realized sometimes, I'll realize what a piece is about after I have a chance to look at it. And I realized it was like, the old crow was kind of a metaphor for the older man. And then the little bluebird was a little more in the future. I felt like. Oh, that's that one. And we're going to slide. Okay. This one was called uh, Thoughts in Time. And this one is also upstairs. I already thanked Eddie Whitlock. That says, thank you, Eddie Whitlock, again, if you're watching this video. All of these book covers came from him. And this one I love because it looked like a garden. And then she was sitting in the garden. So it just kind of worked. What I'll do when I work, I'll have a lot of things spread around. And sometimes it takes a long time for one piece to come together. But this one was a lot of fun. And I split it down the front. And I exposed the pages, the possible words that would have been behind it. Of course, these words had nothing to do with the book. All I had was a book cover. But I use those words and they don't really mean anything except for what the viewer can make out of them. This was, I think, was actually a book on astronomy and I kind of pieced it together. And, there's, and then, the, okay, the photo was actually round, which I just loved. I didn't cut it that way. So the lady's photo was actually, was round like that. It was already a circular photograph and it just seemed to fit in the middle of the cover. Above her, there's a little round portal, and it has a mirror in it. If you look closely, the word time is placed there. So it's just, it's thoughts in time. I was going for a feeling of passing through the pages of time and what we can gain from that. Okay, well this is curtain call. Good. This is curtain call, and it's, well, I included two miniatures in this particular show. I did. I have done an immense series of these miniatures, and they're three-dimensional assembly sculptures. They actually are on little um, lazy susans that are adhered to the bottom, and they can be. They're meant to be spun. They can be spun. Um, this was one that was made really early on when I first started doing this. Um, this one is called Curtain Call. It's one of the few pieces where I have used photographs of some of my family members. Usually I use unknown photos of people, and that way I have free reign to do whatever I want to do with them, place them in any situation. This one actually has family members. Um, there is a little boy inside the structure, and he's sitting in the window. If you get a chance to look at it, you can see it by... I, up in the exhibit, I put mirrors behind it so you can maybe see him in there. But he was actually, he's my Nana's older brother, and his name was Carl. Carl died when he was 12 years old, and it always kind of haunted me since I found out about it as a kid. It was my Nana's older brother. It was just, you know, as a kid, you're like, that's, that's messed up. So I used his life narrative that was cut short and the Peter Pan storyline. And there are references inside this structure of Peter Pan. You'll find Peter Pan things. The other children in the piece, I'm going to show you these. Oh, man. That's left. Oh, I have to, what do 
have to left it. If I'm going, it doesn't matter. Right. You don't have to explain it. Okay. This is a different size of bourbon golf. And it shows a different, uh, like this is my grandmother. I took her from an old family photo. And this is, that's my nana peeking through. And Carl, I don't think you can see that, which means you have to go up to the quiet gallery and look inside it. The other children in the piece, um, besides my nana, is there's a little fairy that is my great aunt Neva. She's at the front, which was in the previous photo. But she's up in the little tree, and those are the children. The little boy at the door is from a found photograph of an unknown child. I kind of thought he looked like me, so I put him there as kind of a welcome to a bit of my own family saga. Now that is curtain call. And so I left click. Here we go. And this is called a room of her own. This is the other miniature that's upstairs. Um, amongst the sea of constant censorship and challenged ideas, this little girl has found a safe place to express herself. The retreat into the attic is a representation of the place inside ourselves. The inner place that is ours alone, the voice that will not be silenced. Even when we are being chased by demons, the escape is still possible. And that's what this one's about. It's about censorship and still finding a way to, to say what you need to say. This one shows um, there are books that are being burned in the fireplace. This was a really exciting one for me to make because it was like the first miniature that I knew that it had an actual narrative that felt important to me that I started to make. So, uh, so the, the titles that are being burned are some of the most frequently banned or challenged books. And in there you can find Huckleberry Finn, Slaughterhouse Five, The Catcher in the Rye, um, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. The text coming from the chimney, which is very, very small, comes, it says, it was a pleasure to burn, and it comes from Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Around the base of the sculpture, you'll find more from Fahrenheit 451 around the base of it. This one I did some more. Oh, Lord. There's some detail shots of going up into the attic. You'll find a little sketchbook, and you find a little bear. This is her, this her retreat. And I think that with artists, everything is kind of a self-portrait. So it's just the way I would deal, deal with things when I was a kid. So the little teddy bear stay and speak, and draw and read, do your thing. And that's what this one's about. Write, speak, and tell your story. This is, if we can pause anytime y'all want and we can ask questions, but we can wait at the end. So. This one is called A Ticket to Read, and it's actually in the children's section upstairs, or down here. We've got two pieces. There's Once Upon a Time, and then this one's called Ticket to Read. But I wanted to show details of this one because you can't really see it on the wall. Um, they were donated, they were purchased by Rosemary Woodall, and then she donated them to be displayed in the children's section of the library. Pages from the book Gulliver's Travels are incorporated into this one. The little accordion thing is from Gulliver's Travels. The little boy, if you look real close at the little boy, he's holding a ticket, and that's his ticket to read, and it's his public library card. So. Next to him is a bird, which floats around a lot. It's actually held by fishing line, and it kind of, but it's uh, got the word voyage on it. It represents the travels one can take while using your library card. But these are the details of that piece. This piece is called Solid Ground, and this is where I get into really more what I work on are certain political things, so that's kind of more where my mind goes. Um, the background of this piece is a book cover from the book The Little Wise One. It's a 1924 edition of African Folk Tales. Collage behind the little girl is a map 
of the African continent from an atlas of around the same time period. And I have to say here that it took me a while to, to disassemble books and to do what I do with them. The books that I do tear up, burn, bend, break, and make into things are usually kind of past, they're past their prime anyway. And I do look for monetary value because I'm like, that would be the one time that I would burn something is going to be worth like a thousand dollars or something. But so far, I've been okay with that. The, the sign, and we go back to this one, the sign that this little girl is holding, she's another unknown child, and I, and I use the children in a lot of different pieces. Like the same children will show up in different pieces of mine. I'll use copies. But the sign that she is holding is a quote by Ida B. Wells. She was a Memphis newspaper editor and activist from the 1880s, 1890s. It was her voice that cried out in protest in regards to the oppression and lynchings against her fellow black citizens. She was forced to flee from, the Mem from Memphis because of threats to her own life. And that's why I came up with the term solidarity, because you've got to speak up anyway. The quote on the sign reads, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. That is what I feel obligated to do with my own art, whether I want to or not. This one is called Water Babies. It's also upstairs, and it's actually the last assemblage piece that I have made. I'm working on paper right now, so you may want to put this in your own personal collection because it may not be anymore. This one, when confronted by news events, my response is to make art. These children were in an area of extreme flooding this past summer. This was taken from a newspaper article. I have them made into photos. I have them printed off, and then I put them into the pieces. Usually I use old photos, but some of my more political uh, contemporary pieces I have, I'm forced to reprint and hope that nobody catches me with a, a lawsuit of any sort. But putting them here with the flooding, um, with the map of, Cal of India behind them with Calcutta, kind of gives the title Water Babies a whole new meaning. And so there they are. This one is called Measuring Up. I fell in love with the expression on this lady's face. She seemed so sure of herself and so comfortable with who she is. She, she was very self-assured. Only the top half of this photo was intact when I found it, so I was only working with just this top half of the studio photo. And she floated around my studio for I don't know how long. I didn't know what to do with her that I found a place for her. I placed her in this broken off piece of furniture. I love the solid feel of the wood. It seemed to kind of reflect her skin. The book cover part actually went through a couple different incarnations before I ended up with this finished piece. The earth rise behind her on the book cover references Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise. So that's what I was referencing there. This is my child. This is the child that's upstairs. And it was, it started out as a mannequin that I found at Reed's Odds and Ends in Watkinsville. I don't know if you guys go there, Charles Stewart has the place and he curated, it's a thrift store, but it's more of a museum. The stuff that he brings in, he's very picky. And this was actually with a mannequin from the 20s. It was a little green-eyed Caucasian girl. And I had her bouncing around my house. She wore a John Lennon shirt for a while. I actually had her in the car riding with me because it upset my daughter, so I put her in there and rode around with her. Um, but then I had her for a while, and there was, I'm a fan of Yoko Ono, and she did a lot of white pieces. And I was going to just paint the child completely white, but then I realized I wanted to do it just black and white half, and then I did the stool half, so the, where the child perches is half black, half white. 
Um, as far as what it represents, I'm not entirely sure. That's kind of up to the viewer, too. But it's more, I feel like, sometimes things are so obvious it's black and white. And also the text that we read in books are black and white, so it kind of goes with that. Now the next one, whoops, what the daisy. You're still looking at the child. Around the child is a birdcage, too. Hey, okay, this is more detail of the child. So this was only a couple weeks ago that I figured out the birdcage, when I was first started to do this show, I was going to have like these origami birds uh, floating from, it was a bigger birdcage I had, and they were going to be uh, strung up and going out the windows of the gallery upstairs. It didn't come to pass. But I put them in the birdcage instead, and so they're floating around the little kid. They're, but they're from bird, they're from the books that are shown on the stool. So they're all folded from Lord of the Flies, Fahrenheit 451, Harry Potter, and that's what I, I used. The little stool has like three little birds there that are flying. And also, to be fair, one of the reasons why I didn't, this sounds like I'm having an excuse, but one of the reasons why I didn't do the birds flat flying, because my daughter, I cannot seem to fold the origami bird, so my, my daughter does them, and she had a baby eight months ago, so I didn't want to put that on her. So that's my excuse, and that's the truth. So I didn't ask Nikki to do that, but thank you, Nikki. This, okay, this kind of shows where my work is actually going, or going back to. This one's called Alphabet Blast, and it's got on, you know, my ABCs, it's funny because my daughter, and she has a little two-year-old, my other daughter, and we'll sing the ABC song and they go, next time won't you sing with me? That's not what I learned. I learned, tell me what you think of me. And she was insistent that that was not how the song went. I found it in an old book and I said, see, there we go. So I had the, the book. What I did with these, was I began taking from sketchbooks and instead of using photos of people, I used some of my sketchbook drawings and I put them in these two. There, there were more, I think there were two or three more upstairs, but it kind of, it reflects back to what I'm doing. I've been focusing on drawing and back to my watercolors again. I'm working on paper. Um, one of the reasons that I'm doing it is my life has changed a little bit and it just really feels good to be moving the pencil again. Because I've been using assemblage and I've been doing object, and I don't know when I'll go back to that. I think I, who knows? If I do, I probably will. I'll probably miss it. But right now I'm doing drawing. And if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, you will see what I'm doing. This one, is one that I remade for the show. It's called Journeys. And I've done a whole series of these window pieces. I like the window frames. Um, because they're just so easy to like, put stuff in. This one originally had, they were doors. These were doors. And they still look like doors. They still are doors. But they open up into a map. And they're a map of where this child is from. Like, like this little girl is, behind her is text from the book Below by Toni Morrison. And so I show where that took place. Um, the one above is Hiroshima, took place in Hiroshima. Um, the one above that one is Slaughterhouse-Five, and so it shows Dresden in there. And there's the little kids. But each one of these children, <laughs> Now, it sounds like I'm really strange with the children, but each one of these, there are copies, either they're either copies or originals are in miniatures that I've got. So these little miniature worlds, this, the kids on the top are in, um, what's it called? It's called Dresden Knights. So it's a miniature that I've got called Dresden Knights. So they are in that one. The one below is in call, a miniature that I have. It's called Hiroshima Holiday. So that little... Little boys in that one. Um, 
The third one down is Rosie's Compass, and that's actually one that's sold. It's out there somewhere, belongs to somebody, which is fantastic, because it's hard to sell the miniatures, but that one actually did find a home. The one on the very bottom is really very cool, because this photo of this little boy, the original is in the miniature. So this is a copy of the original. But the original photo was one that I found in an antique store with my parents when I was seven years old. And it started this whole fascination with people that in these photos, like nobody knew who they were. My mom was like, well, we don't know who that is. And that's weird. So anyway, I carried this photo, and I had him, and then I made him into a miniature I started, it was like one night, this was, oh my god, I started making these miniatures like six years ago. And I realized that he needed to be in this piece. So, it was the first miniature I made. It's called Little Princess Peephole. And I used some little things about um, little, the little prince is kind of in there, but it really isn't about the little prince. It's more about the little immigrant children that are in the alleyway in the piece. So, but it was really exciting to me that I was able to, and it was actually a friend of mine, this is cool, so I'm thinking of things as I stand here. Brad, uh, Laura Taylor, and this is her boyfriend, Brad, Bradley Rosin. If that's, I'm saying it right, Brad, I'm sorry if I don't know your last name correctly. But he came over, they came over and visited, and I was making this piece, this miniature, Little Princess Peephole, and he said, why don't you make it two levels? And I'm like, oh my God. So that goes to him. I made it two levels. I made it where I was able to spin it on a little turntable, so I took it off. That was before I realized you could buy these little things at Lowe's, and I took it off my spice rack. So this Little Princess Peephole Stems from the aid of a little spice rack, and it was a really it was my first one. So it was a really it was a pretty exciting thing. Now that's a little, the little prince. We're going to go to the next slide. This is Little Joe of Jackson County, and oh, there was a report card that I found. You see on the top, there's a little report card, and I think it was 1935 or something on the report card, but I found it. I go to Reed's Odds and Ends a lot. I don't know if you guys go to Reed's Odds and Ends, but she's great too. You can find stuff there for like almost nothing to pay for. It's like, and you don't know what you're gonna find. But she has a lot of the uh, paper stuff that I use, I really. So I found this report card and it kind of moved around a lot. And I just, the, the children's reader, I didn't want to do much to change the visual of that because I just love the way it looked. So for a while there, I just had this piece. I did not have the children, the school photo. I put them on later because it kind of, it felt out of balance with all that was going on at the top and then down here. So basically it's just, this one doesn't mean a whole lot beyond it's just the children going to school. Um, and then I just use other found objects with it. But what I like about my work, too, is that when I don't see a meaning in it, it doesn't take away from what somebody else might think that it means. Or I think that the viewer actually gives power, they give an additional power to art that the artist cannot do. You know, This one is called Games Played. And for some reason, I have no notes on here about this one, so I'm going to have to wing it. Wow. Okay. This one came from. Well, I guess it's pretty. I guess it's self-explanatory. The the children to the right were actually were flying a kite, and I put the American flag. I've done a lot of pieces. Um, about race issues in America. It's, I just have to do that. Um, it took me a while to feel like I had the right to talk about it as a white woman, but 
I do it. And I had a whole show called Dark Cotton at OCAF. So I definitely, and I still keep making things because, and, and I just want to be honest about it, but the, the, we have the two children that are in the front to the left. Um, are they being asked to play or are they standing? Are they, are they invited? Are they not invited? It's kind of, it's kind of left there. And then we have the little white picket fence as if everything is just fine. But we know that things are not always just fine. So that's what that one was kind of about. I had notes with that one, but I don't know what they were. This was cool because what I did, this is up, this is up in the gallery, and I got to bring things that I have that are not used in pieces yet. So this was, it kind of gives us somewhat of an example of how I work in my studio. I'll put things out and they move around a lot. Um, Laura Taylor is a friend of mine. She gave, she gifted me a whole bunch of old shoes. And I ended up with this pair of saddle shoes that I had to have when I was five and six years old. Those the only shoes I would wear. I don't know why, but now I have them and those are actually Buster Browns exactly what I had when I was a kid. And I was just, this is so weird. So they're not actually in a piece now. Some of these were finished. The little clock, the little boy and the clock is, is sort of a finished piece, but the clock is covered with text from Native Sun. So that's all covered with that. We have little photo albums and just the book tip is very important. I found that it reads odds and ends. That is the first book that I remember reading from. It was like, that's when it clicked, except for the only other time that words clicked with me was the, um, the hot apple pie at McDonald's, and it said, caution, Philly may be hot, that clicked. It was like, I was able to like put the words with what I knew it meant, other than the hot apple pie tip was the one that got me reading. So I found a copy of that at Reads, Odds, and Ends, and I had to buy it. So I have it in my possession now, even though it's not the exact one. My mom didn't keep a lot of stuff. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. So I didn't really have a lot of these objects. And I think that's one of the reasons why I collect a lot of objects. My poor kids, they're so screwed with my house. Kids, they're just going to have a lot to take care of. But that's going to be their problem. So that's what it, that's kind of gives guys an idea of, and when you look up there, um, it's just so much fun to move stuff around. I mean, it's just to me, making art is play, and, and that's what I, it's kind of what I do. Um, the three, the little, see the little, the little traffic things, the little reflector, there's three of those that actually came from a series of, I think I had six or seven with the children on them, and they're actually pages from Fahrenheit 451 again, and I burned them. So that was fun. I went through this whole phase of burning things, and I have a very, I have a, a way of doing it in the studio, a very controlled burn, because one time it wasn't so controlled, and I had a little bit of a fire on the carpet, and that was very exciting. But I don't do that anymore. But that was when I, I actually burned, and I was like, I'm burning a book. This is bizarre. But that's what I did to make those pieces. And then there's also, like, there's two finished pieces in here. There's the little, um, Sister and brother, it's a little tiny house. Um, and I did a whole bunch of these little tiny house out of small boxes and with the red roof and I did a whole series of these and I was just selling them at some of the little craft shows that we have. I sold a few, I sold a few, but they all didn't find homes and I have so much stuff in my house. So what I did was it was like over the spring and summer we had a, a Free Art Friday that you do on Instagram, hashtag Free Art Friday. These were gifted all around town. So now I have two of these left. I have one that was my favorite at home, and then there's this one that is up in the, up in the gallery. So those are the only two that I know where they are now. So that's kind of cool. But that was Sister and Brother, and the book that they're standing in front of is Hansel and Gretel. So that's why I put this one in too, because they had the book thing. And then beside it is um, another little, like it was a cigar box, and it was, it's Shirley Temple, if you can recognize a little Shirley Temple, with her, she's got 
She's got like a little psychedelic eyes here. Okay. That's actually Shirley Temple. There's a picture of Shirley Temple. And, um, but I made, made her little psychedelic eyes. So she's in a little magic garden. It's just kind of a little garden scene. The little firefly above her was a drawing that was from my older daughter, who is a fantastic artist, Nikki Ward. And that was from one of her things, and I had cut it out because she didn't want it anymore. It just kind of was floating around, and I put it in this piece. So we kind of worked on this together, even though she didn't know it. And the title of that one is called By and By, simply because I couldn't think of another title. So it's just what it is. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's good. Here we go. I should have been talking about it there. Now you can say, oh, okay, this kid right here, that's me. That's me. And she's in a little white shoe, because I wore those, that was back in the day in the 60s, where people thought you were supposed to, to help your kid walk, you had to have these sturdy shoes. And those shoes kicked my sister quite a few times. I had an older sister, and I would kick her with those very, very heavy sole shoes. It's just, I don't know, it's a simple thing. But whenever I see those shoes, I always think of my poor older sister who never retaliated. She always, because she was like, I couldn't do anything to you because I was supposed to protect you. You're my younger sister. So I kicked her and pinched her. And, you know, that, that sweet little kid was, yeah, she was a kicker. But that's the sister and brother, Hansel and Gretel, and that's by and by. And I think that's all I have for you. Furthermore, I don't know what's next. Um, I've, I'm just going to keep working on paper and doing what I do with that because it just feels right. And um, years ago, I did, oh man, I did like, I was working on children's books and I have actually finished, I have five completed children's books all the pages, the text, everything, and I wasn't able to find publishers because they probably weren't good enough. But I might return to that, I don't know right now. But that's where I'm at. So if we have questions, <laughs> that's all I got for you. Okay, right. A little bit about your design process. Um, do you find that you usually start with like a an object that catches your eye, and from that you kind of determine where you want to go with it, or, I mean, I, and maybe it's many different. Yeah, it's usually, you know, it, it's funny because we can go back and that way we can, I can't work this thing. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's the end of the show. Oh, there we go. It, it, they usually start it usually starts with a photo. And that's how I was working the miniatures, was it always started with the kid's face. And then the objects themselves kind of work into it. But I have to feel something for the objects. I have a lot of people that will give me things, which has been really great. Pat Priest uh, has given me a lot of like um, just odd objects, and she'll gather things for me. And I have to get rid of some of them. Because I'll get these things, and it's like, unless it feels something, it's just, you know, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it's, I don't know, it's a quirky thing. So sometimes, but it's usually, it usually comes from a visual of a kid, of a photo. Uh, it's not always a kid, of course, I do adults too, but I usually am just drawing the children. Mm -hmm. Did that answer it? <laughs> I have one further question. Absolutely. Related to that. So now you said you're doing more drawing. Um, so with that, you're not starting from something found. You're actually starting with something you create. So I guess you're, you're, you have an idea of, of what you want to express with, from the very beginning? When I'm, when I'm doing the drawings, do I have an idea of what the drawing is going to be expressing? Yeah, just mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to say, say sort of in contrast to the found object work. Right. And, and found you know, it's harder. 
Uh -huh. It's harder because I'm starting out with literally like a blank piece of paper. Yeah. And it, it, it has been a, more of a challenge for me because I don't have that catalyst to, but I have a lot of things in the house that I'll, that I'll, I'll view. But it is really different. And it, it, it is harder. And I'm only now, like, kind of figuring out what I'm doing. I've been doing it since, oh my God, I think it was like May that I started, I went back to paper. It was after my daughter moved in with my little grandson. And he's two, so he takes up a lot of space in the house. So I moved my workspace to accommodate that. And that's where I kind of went back to paper too. But usually the, when, I, when I do them, I don't know what they're going to be. I, I, I kind of, I have to leave it open to, to let it kind of become something. And, and it is harder with paper. So I always, you just do pencil. And then it's like, then you go to the, the, the ink farm and then you're kind of like, well, there's not a whole much more adding I can do. So it is more limiting. It is more, I think I need to do more pre-planning, but I think it takes away from the spontaneity too. Where with objects, like, even if you don't like what you've got, you can rip them off and I can start over or I can set it on fire or whatever. But with paper, it's, it's, I have, a lot, I have a lot more respect for people that do that. I, I used to do painting and I never used oil because that just takes too long. I'm very kind of impatient, so I always used acrylic and you could jizz up. There were like paintings, I don't know how many layers of paintings underneath because you could always jezzo over and continue on. But I could make, I could change my mind. And with ink, pen and ink and watercolor, you can't change your mind the same. So it's, it's, it's slowed me down a lot, but I think it's a good thing. You know, because I need to slow down and consider things a little bit more. I'm getting old. <laughs> yes? I think that what you do is very brave. Thank you. Um, it's really hard to permit yourself to express negative ideas and negative feelings mm -hmm. in art, and it's it's scary to me. Is it is it scary to you, especially when you go back in your own your own past and your own feelings? Yeah, it is. That's why I held back from doing some subjects for so long. I, I didn't want to, I wasn't sure whether I could handle what people may say to me or what they would say about the work or, or you know, confrontation. But I, I realized that it was scarier for me to not speak up, to, to just keep it silent. Um, I recently did a, it was a window piece of lynching victims. And I've done this before where I had it in a show where it showed the crowd of people who were either viewers or their perpetrators, what have you. And so they were in the picture. But I finally, I did drawings of the victims. I have a book and I researched it. And so I did these pen and ink drawings and then I cut them out and I hung them in the window piece and it took, it took like a lot of different steps. And when I was doing the drawings of them, they were, they were done very quickly for me, but it was almost as if I just took a breath and I didn't let out until they were done. And I had to just, I had to do that. So it was scarier for me not to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a... yeah. But I don't know, that one's never been on display. It's hard sometimes for me. It's not sometimes. It's really hard for me to find places to exhibit. Yeah. Um, I've had, I've, I've been able, I've been lucky though over the last year, 2020, where my stuff actually traveled, where we weren't able to travel or I couldn't travel. I had a piece go to a show in DC. It, um, I had one go to Chicago. I had one go to upstate New York. So the pieces are getting out there. You know, um, there is a place for some of the more difficult subjects. But it isn't, it's harder, I guess, in my own town. And I think that maybe is part of it. It is hard for people to go, well, what do I do with that? You know? But I do it anyway. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Pardon me? I appreciate that. Well, thank you. 
And I, I'm, I'm glad. It's encouraging. Well, I just have to talk about it. Or at least put it out there so that other people can think about it. And, 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 and think about it in your own space, too. Because we've got a lot of things to reckon with. You know, and, and race is like my biggest. I moved from, we moved to Georgia in 1979, I was 14. We moved here when I was a freshman in high school. And we moved from Springfield, Illinois. And we moved down here. This was when they were like first building these swanky subdivisions. So we were doing well financially. My dad, you know, this was a home office. We moved here. But we moved and it was a complete culture shock because where we were was just this cloistered neighborhood and there was no libraries around. Like there was no libraries like, like what I was used to. And there was just, um, they were, they, I didn't go to, I didn't have, I wasn't in a school where there were any, there was no diversity as far as student population. We were all a bunch of white kids. And it was all very odd. And then the children, the, the kids in the school, that made racial slurs. They, it was just like a kind of a common thing to talk about. And it was all, so I just got quieter because I didn't know how to deal with it. So I just got quiet. I shut down and I just kind of observed everything. And maybe that's where some of it comes from, is my trying to understand. But hopefully we we can get to a point where we're talking more, you know. But it was so weird when we moved here. So the, the, the issues that you're dealing with, the, the political stuff and the racial stuff, do you feel like you'll be able to better communicate that, the two-dimensional stuff than the miniatures? Or is that was that part of your movement? We have to be able to communicate with them. I mean, part, you're moving from the miniatures to, to doing two-dimensional art. Are you, do you think that you'll be able to better deal with the political stuff in that medium? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I think that's partly what I'm missing, like doing my 2D works on paper, is that they're not as political. They don't seem to be as political. They're, they're more about, like, they look more children's book-like. So I'm hoping, I'm kind of hoping that I'm that I'm going to get stronger in what I'm doing and and see where it goes with that. But it seems like I almost like need these objects to kind of give me a, a guide. So I have a feeling I'm probably going to go back to the assemblage work, you know. Um, but I really just like drawing right now. <laughs> yeah, personally, I hope you yeah. go back to the miniatures. I, I really, really enjoy them a lot. <laughs> I, li I like them a lot too. I like them a lot. It's different. It's like different in my house right now because when I do the miniatures, I require like huge blocks of time in the studio, and I'm not really able to do that because I'm a nana now, and my time is kind of pulled to different people, and I don't have like I would I'd be down there for like all morning. I'd be like five, six, seven hours throughout the day, like I would work for a little while and then I'd come back up and rest and I would be able to return. And I haven't been able to do that. So that's part of the reason why I'm doing work on paper too and it's still, I'm still able to express myself. But, you know, maybe when they get older, when the kids get, you know, less needy for Nana or my adult children. But I'm kind of enjoying not being quite so caught up in that, you know. It's kind of nice being a Nana. Yeah, I, uh, just a couple of nights ago, I went to Sydney and watched a movie by uh, Wes Anderson. Are you familiar with him as a director? I know the name, but I don't know him. Yeah, uh, yeah but uh, his work really reminds me of yours. There's just so much density of detail in the really? set. In the so set is he an he artist? Is it Wes Anderson? Is he's he... a, a film director. Film director, okay. Yeah, he's okay. done animation, and a lot of his you know, regular films have a lot of uh, constructed sets. They're so incredibly full of detail. It's a lot like your miniatures, and there's no way you can, you know, it, see everything in there right, unless, unless right. you freeze the frame. Just that's cool. Easy. See, that's kind of what I like with my stuff. It's like you're not going to get everything. You're going to have to return. Right. My stuff requires you to return to look at it again and again. And I will see things like like what I do. Like I have all my miniatures or the ones that I have still that I own. 
are all in these boxes. They're in boxes, and I have like a photo of the miniature with the title on it, the size, so I know exactly what I mean. Oh, gosh, I think I would forget what's in there. But I will pull them out from time to time, like I pulled these two out for this show, and I got to revisit with them. And I got to like look in, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's very satisfying to return, because when I'm making them, I'm so invested in it. And it's almost like it's the only thing that exists, but then I get to come back to them. So I do, I do bring them out, you know, and I hope, and that's what I want to share with my, with the grandchildren too, when they're old enough, and to to bring these out. But see, now you're making me miss. <laughs> you, but you really are though, because it's it's. It, but I don't know where I want to go next. Where would you like to see me go next? Well. It, it kind of interests me that you don't do much mining of your own personal history. Yeah. Um, and do you, are you interested in dreams or the unconscious or anything like that? In dreams? Mm -hmm. Yes, I dream. Mm -hmm. I have... My painting, when I, when I started doing my painting, they were all very personal. Mm -hmm. And it was like I had to get it out. So I think maybe I got it out that way. But one of the things I thought about doing was reconstructing um, my bedroom as a kid in one of the miniatures. I think that would be really neat. But I know somebody who did that. It's amazing. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Because I can remember. Down to the wallpaper and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But, but see. But see. One of the reasons why I'm steered clear of that, and like my miniatures don't really replicate any real, completely real world, because then it ties me to making sure I, I got to get it a certain way, and I like it to be more free form. And because with, if, if it's something that's taken completely from life, then I have to get it right, and and I think I, it could bind, it could kind of bring me down. Does that make sense? Because I know I would have to get it exactly the way it was, and I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know. I see. I, I'm dealing with. I inherited um, hundreds of years of history mm. from my family and all this stuff, and and I'm learning so much about these people, their mystery by yeah. delving into the objects and figuring out what that object meant to them. Yes. Yeah. See, I have. See, and none of my my dad is. Oh, it was funny because I have old family heirlooms or things that my, my great-grandmother had, I would never use that in a, in a, in a piece. No? Mm-mm. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't I don't think, because I know where it was, I know who had it, and it's a family piece, and that's why I like to use objects that come from I don't know, people I don't know. So, because my dad was always like, you're not going you're not gonna break that and put it in, and he's like, no, I'm not dad. But I might, 10 years from now. I don't know, you can't really promise it. Like, no, I mean, I wouldn't take a valuable object or anything, but yeah. like I have a whole stack of letters mm -hmm. from the 1930s where my father uh, couldn't get a job in the Depression, you know, things well, like see, that. See, that's interesting, yeah. Stuff so like we don't that. have any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. My family, they, they moved a lot, and we don't really have a lot of stuff that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can imagine what it's like they left this trail behind, and mm -hmm. all their secrets are coming out now. Isn't it now? So I think I know most of it. No, I probably don't know all the secrets. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, if there aren't any more questions, or if there are, I don't know. I really appreciate everybody coming. Oh, I really do. To see that exhibition. And uh, yeah, check it out. And I can go up there with you, and we can talk if you, if you all want to. And um, yeah, and check out my stuff online. Like I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. And I have a website. It's not kept up to date as much as the social, because I don't understand how to do it. My son was like, it's really easy, and then, I don't understand. I could even like forward the things here. So anyway, hmm. check out, if you're interested in what I do, it's going to be more social media. You know, that's where I update. I don't do social media. <laughs> oh, well, well, then go to the website. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, library. Yeah, library is great. Isn't it though? Mm -hmm. Truly. Truly. And bookstores, that's that.
Yeah, yeah that too. And the little free library. I have a little, little free library in my neighborhood that I, that I keep stocked up. I'm a very serious steward of the little free library. 